Hello, and welcome to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I am your host, Mr. Miller. This podcast will cover a number of topics that happened on this date in history. Please visit the podcast webpage at thishappentoday.buzzsprout.com. There you can download the notes page, which will help you organize the information, as well as develop your own ideas on how these events change the world around us. If you're interested in hearing more, please consider subscribing so you will not miss out on what happens tomorrow in history. Today is August 8th. In an evening televised address on August 8th, 1974, President Richard M. Nixon announced his intention to become the first president in American history to resign. With impeachment proceedings underway against him for his involvement in the Watergate affair, Nixon was finally bowing to pressure from the public and Congress to leave the White House. By taking this action, he said in a solemn address from the Oval Office, I hope that I will have hastened the start of a process of healing which is so desperately needed in America. Just before noon the next day, Nixon officially ended his term as the 37th President of the United States. Before departing with his family in a helicopter from the White House lawn, he smiled farewell and enigmatically raised his arms in a victory or peace salute. The helicopter door was then closed and the Nixon family began their journey home to San Clemente, California. Minutes later, Vice President Gerald R. Ford was sworn in as the 38th President of the United States in the East Room of the White House. After taking the oath of office, President Ford spoke to the nation in a televised address, declaring, My fellow Americans, our long national nightmare is over. He later pardoned Nixon for any crimes he may have committed while in office, explaining that he wanted to end the national divisions created by the Watergate scandal. On June 17, 1972, five men, including a salaried security coordinator for President Nixon's re-election committee, were arrested for breaking into and illegally wiretapping the Democratic National Committee headquarters in the Washington, D.C., Watergate complex. Soon after, two other former White House aides were implicated in the break-in, but the Nixon administration divide, denied any involvement. Late, later that year, reporters Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward of the Washington Post discovered a high echelon conspiracy surrounding the incident, and a political scandal of unprecedented magnitude erupted. In May of 1973, the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, headed by Senator Sam Irvin of North Carolina, began televised proceedings of the rapidly escalating Watergate affair. One week later, Harvard Law Professor Archibald Cox was sworn in as special Watergate prosecutor. During the Senate hearings, former White House legal counsel John Dean testified the Watergate break-in had been approved by former Attorney General John Mitchell with the knowledge of White House advisors John Ehrlichman and H.R. Halderman, and the President Nixon had been aware of the cover-up. Meanwhile, Watergate prosecutor Cox and his staff began to uncover widespread evidence of political espionage by the Nixon re-election committee, illegal wiretapping of thousands of citizens by the administration, and con contributions to the Republican Party in return for political favors. In July, the existence of what were to be called the Watergate tapes, official recordings of White House conversations between Nixon and his staff, was revealed during the Senate hearings. Cox subpoenaed these tapes, and after three months of delay, President Nixon agreed to send summaries of the recordings. Cox rejected the summaries. In what later became known as a Saturday Night Massacre on October 20, 1973, an unprecedented show of executive power, Nixon ordered Attorney General Elliot Richardson and Deputy Attorney General William Ruckerschaus to fire Cox, but both men refused and resigned their post in protest. The role of the Attorney General then fell to Solicitor General Robert Bork, who reluctantly complied with Nixon's request and dismissed Cox. Less than a half an hour later, the White House dispatched FBI agents to close off the offices of the Special Prosecutor, Attorney General, and Deputy Attorney General. Cox's successor was a Special Prosecutor. Leon Jaworski leveled the indictments against the several high-ranking administration officials, including Mitchell and Dean, who were duly convicted. Meanwhile, on November 14, 1973, U.S. District Judge Gerhard Gessel ruled that Cox's dismissal had been illegal. Public confidence in the president rapidly waned, and by the end of July 1974, the House Judiciary Committee had adopted three articles of impeachment against President Nixon, obstruction of justice, abuse of presidential powers, and hindrance of the impeachment process. On July 30th, under coercion from the Supreme Court, Nixon finally released the Watergate tapes, and on August 5th, transcripts of the recordings were released, including a segment in which the president was heard instructing Halderman to order the FBI to halt the Watergate investigation. Three days later, Nixon announced his resignation. And then on this day in 1988, the Chicago Cubs hosted the very first night game in the history of Wrigley Field. 
The first ever night game in professional baseball took place nearly 60 years earlier on May 2nd, 1930 when a Des Moines, Des Moines, Iowa team hosted Wichita for a Western League game. The match drew up 12,000 people at the time when Des Moines was averaging just about 600 fans per game. Evening games soon became popular with the minors, as the minor league ball clubs were routinely folding in the midst of the Great Depression. Adaptable owners found innovation a key to staying in business. The major leagues, though, took five years to catch up to the small town counterparts. The first big night game took place in Cincinnati, Ohio on May 24, 1935 and drew 25,000 fans. The crowd stood by as President Franklin D. Roosevelt symbolically switched on the lights from Washington, D.C. to capitalize on the new evening fan base. The Reds played a night game that year against every National League team, eight games in total, and despite their lousy record of 68-85, and 85, paid attendance rose 117%. Over the next 13 seasons, the rest of the Major League parks followed suit, with one exception, Wrigley Field, which by 1988 was the second oldest bar ballpark in use after Boston's Fenway Park. For 74 seasons, the Cubs played only day games at home. Finally, on August 8, 1988, the Cubs played the Philadelphia Phillies in the park's first night game. 91-year-old Cubs fan Harry Grossman was chosen to turn on the lights. After counting to three, he flipped the switch and announced, Let there be light. Rick Sutcliffe started the game for the Cubs and gave up a home run to Phil Bradley of the Phillies in his fourth pitch. The Cubs star second baseman Ryan Sandberg answered with a two-run home run in the bottom of the first inning, and with the Cubs leading in the bottom of the fourth inning 3-1, to one, the game was called due to rain. Because the five innings needed for the game to be official were not completed, Wrigley's first night game is officially recorded as a 6-4 to four win over the New York Mets on August 9, 1988. And finally, with the American entry into World War II in late 1941, German authorities began planning to land agents in the United States to collect intelligence and carry out attacks against industrial targets. Organizers of these attacks were delegated to the Abwehr, Germany's intelligence agency, which was headed by Admiral Wilhelm Canaris. Direct control of the American operations was given to Wilhelm, William Kapi, a longtime Nazi who had lived in the United States for 12 years. Canaris named the American effort Operation Pistorius after Francis Pistorius, who led the first German settlement in North America. Utilizing the records of the Oslin Institute, a group that had facilitated the return of thousands of Germans from America in the years before the war, COP selected 12 men with blue-collar backgrounds, including two who were naturalized citizens, to begin training at Abwar's Sabotage School near Brandenburg. Four men were quickly dropped from the program, while the remaining eight were divided into two teams under the leadership of Jordan John Desch and Edward Curling. Commencing training in April of 1942, they received their assignments in the following month. Desch was to lead Ernst Berger, Heinz Heinrich, and Richard Quirin in attacking the hydroelectric plants at Niagara Falls, a cryolite plant in Philadelphia, canal locks in the Ohio River, as well as Aluminum Company of America factories in New York, Illinois, and Tennessee. Curling's team of Herman Neubauer, Herm Herbert Haupt and Werner Thiel were designated to strike the water system in New York City, a railroad station in Newark, Horseshoe Bend near Altoona, Pennsylvania, as well as the canal locks at St. Louis and Cincinnati. The teams planned to rendezvous at Cincinnati on July 4, 1942. Issued explosives and American money, the two teams traveled to Brest, France for transport by U-boat to the United States. Embarking on aboard U-584, Curling's team departed on May 25th for Point Verde Beach, Florida, while Dash's team sailed for Long Island aboard U-202 the next day. Arriving first, Dash's team landed on the night of June 13th, coming ashore on a beach near Amagansett, New York. They wore German uniforms to avoid being shot as spies if captured by the landing. Reaching the beach, Dash's men began burying their explosives and other supplies. While his men were changing into civilian clothes, a patrolling Coast Guardsman, Seaman John Cullen, approached the party. Advancing to meet him, Dash lied and told Cullen that his men were stranded fishermen from Southampton. When Dash refused an offer to spend the night in the nearby Coast Guard station, Cullen became suspicious. This was reinforced with one of Dash's men shouted something in German. Really realizing that his cover was blown, Dash attempted to bribe Cullen. Knowing he was outnumbered, Cullen took the money and fled back to the station. Alerting his commanding officer and turning in the money, Cullen and others raced back to the beach. While Dash's men had fled, they saw U-202 departing in the fog. A brief search that morning unearthed German supplies which had been buried in the sand. The Coast Guard informed FBI about the incident and Director J. Edgar Hoover imposed new blackout and commenced a massive manhunt. 
Unfortunately, Dash's men had already reached New York City and easily evaded the FBI's efforts to locate them. On June 16th, Curling's team landed in Florida without incident and began moving to complete their mission. Reaching New York, Dash's team took ho rooms in a hotel and purchased additional civilian clothing. At this point, Dash was aware that Berger had spent 17 months in a concentration camp called for his comrade for a private meeting. At this gathering, Dash informed Berger that he disliked the Nazis and intended to betray the mission to the FBI. Before doing so, he wanted Berger's support and backing. Berger in informed Dash that he too had planned to sabotage the operation. Having come to an accord, they decided that Dash would go to Washington while Berger would remain in New York to oversee Hank and Kieran. Arriving in Washington, Dash was initially dismissed by several officers as a crackpot. He was finally taken seriously when he dumped $84,000 of the mission's money on the desk of the assistant director, D.M. Ladd. Immediately detained, he was interrogated and debriefed for 13 hours while a team in New York moved to capture the rest of his team. Dash cooperated with the authorities, but was unable to provide much information regarding the whereabouts of Curling's team, other than stating they were due to meet in Cincinnati on July 4th. He was also able to provide the FBI with a list of German contacts in the United States, which had been written in invisible ink on a handkerchief issued to him by Abwar. Utilizing this information, the FBI was able to track down Curling's men and took them into custody. With the plot foiled, Dash expected to receive a pardon, but instead was treated the same as the others. As a result, he was asked to be jailed with them so they would know, not know who betrayed the mission. Fearful that a civilian court would be too lenient, President Franklin D. Roosevelt ordered the eight would soon be saboteurs by be tried by a military tribunal. The first held since the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln. Placed before a seven-member commission, the Germans were accused of violating the law of war, violating Article 81 of the Articles of War, defining the offense of corresponding with or giving intelligence to the enemy, violating Article 82 of the Articles of War, defining the offense of spying, and finally, conspiracy to commit the offenses alleged in the first three charges. Though through their lawyers, including Lawson Stone and Kenneth Royal, attempted to save the case, have the case moved to a civilian court, their efforts were in vain. The trial moved forward in the Department of Justice building in Washington that July. All eight were found guilty and sentenced to death. For their assistance in foiling the plot, Dash and Berger had their sentences commuted by Roosevelt and were given 30 years and life in prison, respectively. In 1948, President Harry Truman showed both men clemency and had them deported to the American zone of the occupied Germany. The remaining six were electrocuted at the district jail in Washington on August 8, 1942. You have been listening to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I thank you for listening and I hope that you have enjoyed learning about historical events from the past. Thank you to the following websites for their information regarding today's topics. ThePeopleHistory.com Nixon resigns at history.com, lights go on at Wrigley Field at history.com, and Operation Pistorius at thoughtco.com. The music used as the background track for this podcast is Americana, created by Kevin McLeod on incompetech.com. If you enjoyed this information and would like to hear more, please consider subscribing, as this will keep the historical events in your feed in the morning for each day. I hope you have a great day.